Good evening and uh, uh, welcome to this new episode of uh, Africa Talks, brought to you by every week uh, by India Africa Today. And uh, in today's episode, we'll be talking about the experiment of online education world over and particularly in Africa and what have been the challenges and opportunities in terms of learning and accessibility to technology. Uh, to talk more about, uh, about today's issue, I have an eminent uh, panel of uh, five speakers today with me. I would like to first introduce uh, uh, Mr. Linford Molaudi. Mr. Linford, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Linford is an academician. He's a faculty at uh, University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Also a director of an NGO, T-Stern Projects, which, focus on, uh, which focuses on community development and teacher training. We would like to um, have your views on today's um, uh, theme later in the show, uh, Mr. Linford. Our second I panelist today is uh, Mr. Albert Opoku. He's joining us from Ghana. Mr. Opoku, welcome to Africa Talks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Opoku has been uh, working on digitization of medical education in Ghana. He is also the deputy chief um, health tutor at nursing and, and midwifery training college in Kumasi. We, we look forward to have your views in the show today, uh, Mr. Albert. Thank you, thank you. Our next panelist today is uh, Mr. Patrick Kaboyo from Uganda. Mr. Patrick is National Secretary of the Federation of Non-State Education Institutions, Uganda. Mr. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ralph, for inviting me and the beginning panel. Great. Our next panelist today is um, Mr. Abdul Ganyu Yakub. He's from Nigeria and um, he's a civic technology activist and a technopreneur professional and also a co-founder of Digital Development Hub. Uh, Mr. Yakub, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mr. Rao. Our next panelist is uh, Mr. Mohit Gaur. He's from India. He's a tech entrepreneur working on artificial intelligence to create social networking community in the education sector. And he is representing Exilient Africa today in the show. Mr. Mohit Gaur, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Great. Uh, friends, in the last, this is the seven month, seventh month of the year. And then in the last seven months, uh, the pandemic has devastated uh, millions of lives. More than 12 million people have been infected by the virus and more than five lakh people world over have died because of the pandemic. Uh, in the last few months, we have seen that the health crisis is now gradually turning into several more kind of crises like livelihood crisis, education crisis. And when we specifically talk about children, it's gradually turning into a child rights crisis also. World over specifically in developing countries, like India and in various countries in Africa, it has been seen that because of the pandemic as schools are closed, children are not able to access not only education, but also nutritious food and health services like immunization services. It's becoming a big challenge for our children and it's going to have a long-term impact on the health and well-being of our children. Uh, coming back to today's topic, Today, specifically, we'll be discussing about education. As you all know, world over schools and universities are closed. And uh, in several countries, online education is the new way of providing education or ensuring that children continue to learn even during the pandemic. But how successful this experiment has been, what have been the challenges, and how new opportunities could be created in the coming years in terms of online education. To discuss on that, uh, I have a very eminent group of panelists today. First of all, I would like to go to Mr. Linford Molaudi from South Africa. Mr. Linford, if you could give an overview of online education in your own country in South Africa, what has been done in the context of the pandemic and what steps have been taken by the government or the non governmental organizations to ensure that our children and our youth continue to learn even during the pandemic. Mr. Linford. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Um, you, it, it may be um, uh, um, uh, uh, a phenomenon in almost every country um, that we have, um, we have both public and uh, private education. And I'm going to respond on both uh, public and private and then um, higher education as I'm also in higher education. So um, with regard to the public education, um, there hasn't been much progress when it came, when, when it came to um, um, in ensuring that learners still learn at home. However, there were quite great attempts to do that in terms of uh, broadcasting of, um, of, of digital lessons on, on online and even um, on the radio. Those were the attempts that were taken over. But then um, private education, due to the uh, uh, more um, adv advantageous situations, they, many of them could actually continue um, the teaching and learning um, online. And when it, came to, when it comes to um, higher education, most of our institutions have really um, you know, transformed into emergency remote teaching and learning. And um, yeah, some of them really uh, did well, like the university in which I am, which is the University of Johannesburg. We've been on it um, um, since uh, May and we, we have done quite well and we're still, we're still doing quite well so far. But I have to admit that it's not something that comes easy. It's a great challenge and we face a lot of resistance from the communities at large, from the students or learners in the basic education as well as um, you know, from our, um, our, vicinity, our vicinities. But uh, much has been done in higher education, uh, but less has been done in the basic education. Okay. Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, you talked about the kind of resistance you have been facing from community and from students and the kind of challenges that, uh, that you have faced in the last few months uh, since when you have started the experiment of online education. We'll come back on that point. Uh, we would like to go now to, to Mr. Albert Opoku, who is from Ghana. Mr. Opoku, if you could give us some overview of what steps have been taken in your country to ensure that some kind of continuity in terms of learning you know, uh, is there during the pandemic also. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, um, in Ghana too, as um, it's not different from what Lenford said. In Ghana, we have started, or uh, we started with the online teaching right from the basic, both private and uh, public, to the secondary to tertiary. At all these levels, there's some kind of um, uh, online teaching going on, but. It does not come without challenges, as uh, Lenford said, in, uh, pertaining in South Africa. In Ghana, we have a lot of challenges with the um, internet connectivity. I hope you come back to the challenges. So in Ghana, it's not different from South Africa and other parts of African countries. We are facing challenges. We are trying our best to ensure that learning continue in this pandemic, but without challenges. Um, we have few occasions where we have um, digital learning on our TVs, uh, on the public TVs and then private TV stations going on uh, to ensure that there's continuity of learning. Okay. So that is what is actually Great. pertaining. We would like Ghana. to know more details uh, uh, about that later in the show. Uh, Coming to you, Mr. Patrick okay. Kaboyo. Uh, Mr. Patrick is joining us from Uganda. Uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, what is the scenario in your country in terms of education, in terms of ensuring the continuity of uh, education in schools and uh, in colleges uh, during this pandemic? Thank you so much, Mr. Rao and uh, panelists. To start with, this pandemic, of course, happened as a surprise and it won everybody not prepared. And when it happened uh, on the 20th of March, His Excellency the President of Uganda ordered for the closure of all schools. And two days after, we drew our children from all education institutions to close to 15 million learners from all ECDC universities.
Bashe were brought back home. And that closure meant that we had to have a paradigm shift. So what the Minister of Education and Post did was embark on an online learning platform managed by the NCDC, which is the National Curriculum Development Center. But before it did that, other private education institutions had uh, already started posting work on the television stations that are presently op op or operational in Uganda to ensure that learners from private schools can uh, access their teachers. And as that took root, also government ensured that uh, there is this work from the NCDC channeled to online learning to those that are able. And also we had the minister think of setting up an online committee that should look at uh, both digital content and online learning in terms of how the whole country can be covered. But to be precise, the online learning has not taken root to all the villages and communities in the country because of uh, inaccessibility to internet, but also electricity connectivity is a bit of a challenge. And as if that's not enough, there is a tariff for every internet user, uh, which is referred to as OTT tax or the over the top. So even if you have a smartphone, yeah. you will not be able to access online learning. And also communities are quite poor like in any other country. You'll find that parents are struggling to see how they can put food on the table. You know, they are locked up for all these months. And then there is also a cost for internet. So it is quite of a big challenge. And we hope that uh, we do a lot of learning from what we are getting. Yes. Great. Uh, uh, coming to you, Mr. Yakub, uh, uh, you are from Nigeria. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, initiatives have been taken in Nigeria in terms of uh, online learning for school and uh, higher education? Uh, well, uh, much more like whatever other, uh, the previous uh, panelists uh, said. Uh, during the, I mean, during the, with the rise of the pandemic in Nigeria, and the government quickly uh, adopted some strategies of um, countering the, the effect of the, the COVID-19. Uh, issued the guidelines on uh, banning, banning um, interstate travels, ban, imposed lockdown on, on, on many of Nigerian states. Also, schools were closed, uh, both uh, right from primary to tertiary uh, education. Uh, but in terms of responses, yes, within the innovation community, um, the technopreneurs uh, um, 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 mobilize themselves and also see how we can come up with an interim solution to that problem. Uh, I think quite that, a number that, that's of that's a very interesting started. point. Uh, I think that's a very interesting point you have raised, uh, uh, Mr. Yaku, about, about the role of technopreneurs. And uh, uh, we'll come back on that and uh, we'll have more discussion about that also. Coming to you, Mr. Mohit Gaur, you have been working uh, in, 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 in the education sector, particularly in making it more technologically accessible. Uh, what, yes. have been, what have been your view and how do you see the current scenario of learning world over in the context of the pandemic? Well, uh, as a pandemic spread in, uh, in India as well, the lockdown was initiated quite early. And what the education fraternity and the education community noticed is that there are a lot of things that need to be taken care of while we set up the entire infrastructure to cater to the uh, education in the Indian, uh, Indian country. Now what happened is a lot of things like an entire machinery, entire uh, community turned into an online education community. And that's where a lot of challenges were also faced because in India, the internet connections are still not that good that, okay, we can cater to a larger audience at the same, at the similar point of time. But still many of the teachers just tried their best adopting various uh, use cases and adopting various methods in teaching the kids so that their education does not suffer at all. In the meanwhile, 
the help from the alumni of the school alumni also came up the children who are just uh, passed out of the schools are helping their teachers to learn the new technological ways to impart education to their juniors in the schools and everything and along with that what indian uh, government and indian education fraternity did uh, a, a very fantastic job is that they reduced the syllabus for the entire academic year so that essential things are taught and students are still able to learn what they should learn what they need to learn in the current scenario so our indian teachers and indian principals are trying their best to not let the education of the children in india hamper at any cost they are trying their level best and we have like we have been a decently successful in this as well so okay yeah so you you think we have been decently successful in 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 providing continuous learning to students uh, through online mode so we'll discuss more on that later in sure. the show uh, uh in their opening remarks uh, all the five panelists talked about uh, the challenges they have been facing in their own countries uh, uh to promote online education uh coming to you mr linford uh Mr. Linford uh, Molawdi, uh, how would you describe these challenges? Are these challenges only in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, only in terms of technology, or also in terms of the non-readiness of the educational curriculum in 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 getting you know transformed into an online education system, or also getting some kind of uh, challenge in terms of acceptability of this mode of teaching by the communities and students so how would you like to summarize the kind of challenges you have seen in your own country uh, in terms of promoting online education um all those you've mentioned um are, are, are contributors towards success for integration of technology um in education of course some are technical and some are 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 are, are, are human um, issues with regard to our perceptions of technology and if we do not sort that out first you know to try to influence the human being themselves there's no way that um, we are going to be successful or rather go anywhere because the first thing that we need to understand and which i think has been um quite a biggest factor in um towards the resistance of people is um you know our 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 it's it's our um we we've got this uh you know um uh, we we are not willing to accept that the world is changing we are living in a world that is that is volatile and um, uh, full of uncertainty and and there's a lot of ambiguity you know and we need to accept uh, we need to accept that and then when we meet challenges like this uh, like the one that we have um just experienced we we need to be willing to come up with solutions instead of um resisting whatever um challenges that are coming however that doesn't mean the 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 the, the challenges that people are, are are seeing or those that we are seeing are not in existence they are um, um for instance um, we've got lots of issues of data and um and and access uh, for instance so when it comes to mobile data we do understand that mobile data is quite uh, very much expensive but the reality is many of our youngsters are already online so it's not like we we are moving them from one area to another what we need that to do um or what we are rather struggling with is to just help them repurpose whatever that they have been doing to start using technological tools for uh, um for you know for teaching and learning purposes and when it comes to access some people think of computers but we end up forgetting that the cell phone on its own can be utilized as a teaching and learning tool and that's a computer on its own so we need to start changing perceptions of people to uh, start being um, you know solution based so that 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 was one of um the, the the challenges that we are having and one of the uh, the most uh, which i think if if this one isn't really um addressed and we are going to have um issues that last forever is that as much as we 
um, some schools or even the institutions of higher learning have transformed into into online uh, into the online space. I don't think online teaching and, and learning has been attained. What we did was, um, or what many are doing, is just the mere transformation, or, or rather the mere movement of traditional ways of teaching to online. So our ways of teaching have, haven't changed at all. We merely regurgitating our traditional ways of teaching on an online space. Nothing yeah. much has I think that's a, that's a very interesting point Mr. Linford has made. While the platform of teaching has changed, but our ways of teaching have not changed. Mohit, I'll come to you later on on this very interesting point that what are what are the skills that teachers need to you know develop and, and you being working in the artificial intelligence sector, how, how you can equip teachers with those skills in, 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 in the changing times, in the changing pedagogy methods. So we'll, we'll come to you later on on that issue. Coming to Definitely. you, uh, uh, Mr. Yakub, uh, uh, Mr. Linford was talking about uh, specific challenges uh, that are there in online learning in, in his country. We would like to understand from you, in Nigeria, what are the specific challenges? Are they technology specific challenges or are there more you know social economic challenges that you have to face in this transformation of education system from classroom to online based education yeah there are both of them we have technological uh, problem and socio economic uh, looking at the technological uh, uh, problem uh, we it's a common knowledge that in uh, we have a poor information technology infrastructure in Nigeria there is that regional imbalance between the south and the north in terms of uh, internet penetration, uh, adoption of internet, and also there is high cost of uh, internet data in Nigeria, one of the, the, the most expensive in the world. So these are major issues. Another very important issue is uh, in Nigeria, we have a problem of uh, electricity, high cost of electricity and also uh, poor access to electric electricity is also another very big problem. Um, apart from that, there are also socioeconomic issues. Nigerian uh, Nigerian educational sector has a very strong labor union, and those labor unions seems to be resistant to this kind of changes. And we had an issue with them when the federal government of Nigeria declared that every tertiary institution has to migrate to online teaching and learning. Uh, and the, 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 the forefront uh, union of academic academics came out to uh, counter those issues, uh, citing poor infrastructure as well uh, as the major reason for them resisting these this changes. But then there are a lot of uh, um, accusations against those uh, organizations in terms of resistance to changes and the rest of them. So this is a combination of many factors in, in terms of uh, migration to online learning in Nigeria. Yeah. But of course, a huge opportunity to that. The market is huge um, yeah. um, um, and the opportunity is big. Uh, a little has to be done to, to make sure that uh, that market sure. has been honey. Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll come to the opportunities uh, 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 also later in the show. Coming to you, uh, uh, Mr. Albert, uh, you have been working uh, for digitization of medical education in the country. Uh, how you have been pursuing that and what have been the challenges in doing that in Ghana? Well, thank you very much. As our uh, colleague panelists have said, um, the challenges have to do with the uh, infrastructure connecting to uh, internet connectivity. We don't have enough Wi-Fi in our secondary schools and uh, even the tertiary institutions. Not alone talking about the the lower levels, the primary and then the secondary. So that has been a major problem. That is the internet infrastructure and the information communication technology infrastructure. And uh, it has also come to do with the cost of uh, internet devices. Um, let's talk about the means of accessing internet, the smartphones, the laptops, and then the tablets which are used to access internet. 
Um, these uh, devices are uh, quite expensive comparative to our uh, local economy. And therefore, most of the average uh, workers in the country cannot afford uh, the smartphone for their children, especially those in our villages. So it puts a very strong um, deficiency for those people to access internet. And then also uh, internet connectivity again, we mostly because we don't have enough Wi-Fi in our secondary schools and in our tertiary institutions, we resort to the use of the uh, internet from the telecommunication uh, companies like MTN, Vodafone, the Airtel Tigo. And it's quite expensive using their data to access online education. So um, these are problems that is associated with the internet infrastructure and then connectivity. And then we also have problem with the curriculum that is not actually um, emphasized on online education. So when this COVID came and then we were compelled to switch to online teaching and learning, it, it, it was actually a difficult situation for us because we have not come to accept that uh, online teaching is part of our system of learning. So when we get to the uh, opportunities, I think that the um, yeah. industry should also come in with their support so that we can have some sort of uh, problem solving approach to this yes. problem that we, we, need, we need support industry. from the industry to provide some kind of solutions. You know, very interesting point uh, which uh, Mr. Albert made was that, you know, somehow, uh, you know, so many months have gone, but still for several governments and for people, they have not still still been able to accept that you know online education is 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 is, is a formal mode of learning now. So I think it will take some more time to enhance that acceptability of online medium as a as a preferred mode of learning. Maybe it will take some more months or maybe years to do that. Coming to you, Mr. Patrick Caboyo, uh, talking about Uganda. Uh, what are the specific challenges you have seen uh, in Uganda in the last few months in terms of, uh, you know, providing online education? Thank you, Mr. Rao. Like any other African country, poverty bites, and we find that uh, a few families have access to a smartphone because with online learning, even if you are to do it at home, you must have a smartphone, which is operational, which you can charge, but in the countryside, not in the cities and urban areas, you find that uh, most phones are not charged because we are still relying on the hydroelectric power, there is no diversification of other sources of energy like solar, biogas, and that of course hinders online learning. Largely, we are seeing that uh, students' learning is not connected to what goes on at home. Most of them are tired of being at home because they think that uh, being at home does not facilitate or support learning. That to me is uh, a requirement for policy shift so that there should be a way how schools are linked to homes in terms of learning. And also when this COVID hit us as a country, was during the budget and planning season. We expected that uh, with, the with the pandemic, there would be serious budgetary allocation in terms of mitigation. But our sector did not ask for a supplementary budget or to think aloud that uh, this online learning would require a lot of funding to have both the hardware and software infrastructure set. So in terms of funding, it is still a challenge that we still grapple with. But also another challenge came about with um, the service providers in terms of telecom companies that uh, were to offer support to the COVID task force. The country set up a national task force, task force for COVID where 
every company, every person of goodwill was presenting items and money to help the country. But it was quite disturbing to see a company like Airtel or to see a company like MTN Uganda donate money in hard cash in terms of billion, millions of shillings, like 500 million. And my thinking was, wait a minute, it would be such money translate into data that can be distributed across the country to ensure that those who yes. access online learning have an enhancement, which never came to pass. Meaning that COVID has not helped us to learn. We are still operating in our old system. And I think we need to move very fast and adapt to the new changes. Yes, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Mohit Gaur, uh, we have heard our four panelists who, who are from different African countries. And I think the problems and the challenges they have highlighted are very much similar to what we see in India in terms of accessibility, in terms of high rates of uh, you know, data, in terms of availability of smartphones. So in a way, these are the specific challenges which somehow determines how uh, accessible online learning would be, you know. In India also, uh, a lot of youngsters in schools and colleges, children in schools are not able to access online education because they are in far-flung areas, they're in villages where digital infrastructure has not reached, their family has just one phone, which is not a smartphone, they can't, you know, have classes on that phone. So there are, there are similar kind of, um, uh, you know, challenges. How, you know, tech entrepreneurs like you can provide some solutions in the coming years to resolve this kind of you know, complex situation and make online education more accessible to people at large? Well, uh, yeah, we can use a very uh, detailed strategy and detailed vision in this in, if we want to bring education and transform it into an online education space. First, we need to train our teachers and we need to train our educators about the ad uh, user adaptability of the technology. The teachers should be so much comfortable with using the technology that they are, they, they should feel like they are sitting and teaching in the class itself. Once the teachers feel comfortable and teachers and online educators are more confident, then they can teach in, in a better way. Along with that, as you said that uh, the, uh, Internet accessibility is an issue. Yeah, it is an issue at the moment, but in the coming years, internet accessibility will be very much widespread with the new technologies that are coming up. And along with that, the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that we should, we have to focus on an online merges offline model where everything that is happening offline is recorded and is available online as well. And everything that is happening online is recorded and is available offline as well. So that it goes a parallel synchronization within the both uh, within both the spheres, so that everyone is in the loop. Everyone, like parents, teachers, and students, everyone is in the loop, and we can use the existing models to do the same. Along with that, we can definitely uh, use artificial intelligence, uh, like technologies like artificial intelligence and IoT, which which can which can be termed as an aid to the teachers, where we can just help the teachers in teaching. Uh, the courses online wherein we give them all the facilities that they they would they don't even know that if they would need those or not but if we provide those services to the teachers and explain the benefits to them then yes we can definitely like transition from an offline run system offline run mechanism to an offline merges online mechanism and that's the need of the r at the moment because everything that we do at the current uh, 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 like day to day life is being turned into an online media so merging of both the things will be a key role and will play a key part in the future. Okay, so that kind of integration is very much required today. That's what Mr. Mohit Gaur is saying. Coming to you, uh, uh, Mr. Yakub, uh, as a technology, as a tech entrepreneur, what would you like to suggest? What would be your recommendations to make this transition to online learning uh, more successful socially integrated and uh, and it's more fruitful for everybody please uh, uh, please unmute yourself yes 
Can you hear me? Okay, yes, great. yes, we can hear that, you now. Yeah, that requires um, a, a whole lot of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach. It requires uh, uh, serious sensitizations within the the, the teaching. Um, uh, I mean, the, the academics has to be sensitized thoroughly. Parent, teachers, opinion leaders in all communities has to be sensitized and make them understand that it is an era of online learning. That is in the side from the side of uh, advocacy. Another thing is also it has to be decentralized. In decentralization in the sense that we need to incubate as many startups as we can that can provide those services that are required to ensure penetration of online education in different communities, both high to rich communities, rural and urban communities in Nigeria and Africa at large. And also uh, we need to sensitize the government to also uh, ensure that um, uh, improve Mr. Yakuba, I think there is some internet uh, issue there. We can't uh, hear you. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Linford. Uh, uh, Hello. I, I would like to just add something yeah, if improve, you don't mind. Uh, infrastructure I think Mr. in uh, internet is infrastructure in, in, in the country. And also we have to mention and, and, and zero rating as one of uh, everybody from every country within African subcontinent. It has been reported that cost of internet Yeah, uh, Mr. Yakub, I think um, uh, there is some internet issue there, and we got your point. Uh, coming to you, Mohit, you would like to say something? You raise yeah, your hand. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. As yeah. Uh, 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 with all the we due respect to all the panelists, no, I just, country. I I just yes. got like got a got a gist that internet accessibility and the high cost of internet accessibility in the African region is a very prime concern to all of us. Well, uh, we can do that. We can do one thing that. Uh, we can build we can build up a community of all the educators and uh, government officials and everyone and along with that we can res uh, we can request the respective governments of the countries to because education is actually the building block of a nation without investing in education the nation's nation's uh, development is hampered a bit so what we can request to the government that uh, we can reduce the cost of internet for essential things like education, like for uh, using educational content online and for uh, se seamless integration in that, that might help in penetration of uh, online education in far from areas. And that would uh, help other, that would help teachers and learners to come together online and have a phenomenal experience in that. Yeah, I think, I think a very strong advocacy needs to be done at the government level to ensure that, you know, the rates for, uh, using internet for education, it they comes down sharply so that Perfect. internet can be used, uh, you know, for the larger purpose of providing education to, to a large cross section of people. Coming to you, Mr. Linford, um, uh, you talked about uh, several challenges, uh, you know, in terms of uh, making online education more accessible. In terms of recommendations, what you would like to say specifically, two or three recommendations you would like to make, which, which, which are implementable, which the government, or the corporate sector, or the civil society sector, the, all the different stakeholders that are part of it can actually implement that in the coming years and make online education a more accessible way of learning. Well, <clears throat> there's a tendency of, of drifting into a technocentric view of, 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 of um, you know, online teaching and then or you, integration of technology in education. We need to understand that here technology does not drive the competencies that we want to reach in education. So it's, it's, we need to start thinking about technology as tools to think with, not tools to learn about. And, and, and so, so, so that, that will help us to design infrastructure or technological tools that are intended for learning not intended for them to drive what learners must learn. Because when you look at the upcoming policies and upcoming solutions that are being brought, especially by lots of either technopreneurs, lots of technicians on the television, on the radio, what we see is that 
it's, it's, it's good platforms that they have designed, but learning does not take place. A teacher is there as a preacher or as a commander, but there's no investment on what learning is all about. So I think it's, it's time that we, we start thinking, because this has been going on for a very, very long time, where the designers of technology do not have much knowledge about what learning is all about. So we need to start, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, combining the two. We, not, we need to invest in technology and in understanding what learning is all about. So the technician and the teacher must come together. And then we also need to start understanding uh, the, the, uh, that you don't teach technology. We, we need to think about the content, technology, and competencies that we need to teach our learners and teachers in order for them to be able to survive in the VUCA world. You know, so those are some of the, the recommendations that I, um, um, I think we also need to bear in mind. And again, there is a view that just because one is coming from the rural village, uh, then they won't be able to thrive. These people have been thriving for a very, very long time. Um, and and, and the, the, there's a lot of proof uh, about that. What we need to do is to help learners realize their potential and their strengths instead of thinking, because right now, many of us are like shame. If we go uh, um, uh, online or we use digital tools, learners in the rural village won't be able to do this. this we are undermining our learners' intelligence. What we need to do is to invoke that capability of being able to thrive even in difficult situation. And we can do it using the shoestring methods of teaching and learning within um, using technological tools. So we need to use what we have to make it work because we cannot wait until government provides everything. Government cannot really provide everything. What we need to do is all of us must have major contribution into making this, um, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, progress. And then people are talking, yes. of course, about uh, socioeconomic issues. Indeed, socioeconomic issues are there, will be there. But at the end of the day, we need to discuss socioeconomic issues in tandem with solutions. Not that because in the rural village, there's no network, then it means online learning and teaching um, won't take place. It will take place if we want it to take place. It will take place if we start teaching people that uh, about internet traffic. When during the day should you go online and how to behave responsibly using the available little data that you have. Just to give you a, a, a background context, South Africa uh, with 10 gigabyte uh, day data and, and 20 gigabyte night safe data which is what many students have been um, um, requesting. So even, uh, um, it, 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 so, so they've been provided with that data, but there's still people who complain that that 10 gigabyte data is little, you know? So which means what we did, we provided tools, but have never conscientized students that the tools come with responsibility. If you are not responsible with what you have, we are not going to be responsible. You know, a teacher can never be responsible. So that is what I think lacks, um, you know, responsibility uh, that comes yeah. along with some of the decisions. Yes, that I think that, that's a very interesting point. And a very important point you made earlier was that apart from investing in technology, there is, there is a need to invest in the training and capacity building of teachers also. So that they can, there is an integration of technology and, 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 and the teachers who have to actually use that technology and as a tool to impart learning to to, to, to students. I think that's a very interesting point. Coming to you, Mr. Albert, uh, uh, the specific challenges you talked about earlier. Now, what would be your suggestion? How different stakeholders need to come together to provide short-term and long-term solutions to make online learning a more rewarding affair? Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Lim Ford has made a very interesting and uh, very vital contribution. As he has said that um, to make online teaching and learning very easy and then very accommodating for us, 
I think that Lingos has said it all. The educationists and then the industry, those who deal with these um, uh, devices that are used for the internet access to come together and then develop some of the softwares that are basically for education, some of the devices basically for education, not for them to develop it and then we have to use them for education. So there should be that collaboration between industry and then the educational system so that we can put them together. And then also, as we have said, there's a need to also incorporate uh, this online teaching and learning into our curriculum. It's not like um, the, uh, it, it should happen when there is crisis, but then once students are admitted, their curriculum should teach them that this time around, you have to learn how to learn on online. So that in case of any um, eventualities like uh, this pandemic, there's no um, uh, panic uh, decisions that people should learn from online. So this is what I want to suggest so that we, if we put our heads together, we can come up with a very uh, important solution to this problem of challenges facing online teaching and learning. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Albert. Uh, coming to you, uh, Mr. Patrick Caboyo. Uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I think. Uh, Mr. Patrick, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? We can't see you. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Patrick. Um, Mr. Patrick, last point from your side before we close the program. What would you like to recommend in terms of solutions I, for the I coming think, future? Yes, I have about three points to make. One, it is clear to us that uh, much as the SDG tagline is not leaving anyone behind, with this COVID and the challenges we are facing, I think we have been left behind because our populations are very young, they're energetic, they yearn for ICT, use of technology, but the incapacities of our government because of wrong prioritization uh -huh. leaves them without power, leaves them without access. So we can only have the access that Linford is talking about if each one is not left behind. But going forward, I think we have to enact new legislation to ensure that all our people are brought on board. We need to have a policy shift to ensure that where we are spending, we can now have a paradigm shift to fund ICT infrastructure, both hardware and software. But also we need to ensure that the public-private partnerships that we have, like uh, those of telephone and telecom companies are strengthened to ensure that they are spending where it's right. And that is the, where the data and internet connectivity of schools should be across board from nursery up to university. I think that's the word. I think that, that, that that's a very important point. So, Mohit, last word from you as a young technopreneur. Uh, how do you see the startup industry making a positive dent in this, uh, you know, in this area of uh, online learning? Uh, please uh, unmute yourself. Sorry, my bad, my bad. Yeah. yeah. So what I, what I believe is that the startups have to make a ready to use solution where teachers don't have to just dwell their mind into learning the technology first and then imparting the education. Like a teacher uh, teaches the best with a chalk and a duster. So these are the tools that are being available uh, that are being made available to the teachers. In the similar way, we we as an industry, we as a startup ecosystem, uh, dealing with the education community. We have to just pull up our socks and we have to just strive to make us make the solutions ready to use where teachers don't have to just like uh, learn a lot about technology. They just need to, uh, we just need to make it so easy to use that they just need to teach. So first thing is that. Second, we need to, as mentioned earlier, for, uh, for later part as well, we need to imp uh, invest in the capacity building of various, uh, various uh, teachers as well. As like in, in India, what, what is being done, it's like along with the older generation of teachers, there are younger generation of teachers as well. And they are 
just exchanging their knowledge with each other the experienced teachers are, uh, are teaching the new teachers that how to handle uh, the class and everything along with that the younger generation teachers are helping the older ones to understand the technology better so i guess the uh, a symbiotic collaboration of all the stakeholders be it teachers student parents government startup industries and everything community and everything we need to just work in a very symbiotic manner so that we can definitely take this take education to like to a next paradigm of online education all together and yeah, that's exactly. where i believe the next the future of education lies yeah exactly so concerted efforts are required from different stakeholders uh, thank you so much uh, gentlemen for joining uh, us today in this uh, wonderful conversation uh, uh, thank you uh, mr linford malori mr mr albert ofoku mr patrick kaboyo mr mr abdul ganyu yakub and mr mohit god for sharing your views today and uh, and 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 we are ending this show on a very positive note i have i have heard all of you you all of you are hopeful that if right steps are taken at various levels at the government government level at the level of civil society at the level of the corporate and the startup sector i think if all these stakeholders start working together with the same intensity and with the same objective online classes could be made more accessible and in fact learning in a way could reach to a larger cross section of people throughout africa and india and one point i would like to make uh, a lot of experiments are also being done currently in india and in africa i'm sure also about offline education you know where internet can't reach where mm. smartphones are not you know projects right there where you have recorded messages recorded curriculum recorded you know the chapters are being given to the community and youngsters in the community who are interested in making children learn within their villages they are using those chapters those that curriculum in imparting education in a very decentralized way within their own villages within their own communities so i think the civil society groups people and communities also have a very important role to play in 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 furthering uh, the cause of online education in ensuring specifically spe specifically in the, in times of pandemic that our children continue to learn you know continue to get education within their houses in a very safe and secure way thank you so much gentlemen once again for joining us today viewers it was a wonderful discussion today and i look forward to have you again next week in another show goodbye and good night thank you thank you mr rao thank you thank you thank you thank you mr rao good night everyone thank you